Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to D Dallas Church. My name is David. It's great to be with you here to celebrate this Christmas season as we um, celebrate and remember Jesus' Jesus's birth. If you're new with us, go by and stop at the Connections booth. Uh, we have a gift for you just for visiting with us today. If you're joining us online, uh, your chat host would like to connect with you as well. Uh, maybe you haven't noticed this, uh, this tree over here, this rather large tree. Um, it's kind of hard to see right now, so we've got Daryl, our uh, master of lights, over here. Uh, we're just going to do a quick countdown, you know, three, two, one, and then say Merry Christmas. So if you guys are ready, let's go ahead and do that. Three, two, two one. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas!
So this uh, little guy took his first breath of life uh, in a hospital not too far from here. And it was in the early 70s. And his mom was pretty excited. This is child number two for her. And uh, it was a holiday. And certainly she was anticipating this young little boy's birth, but also really hoping to have some Thanksgiving turkey stuffing and mashed potatoes. So I'm not sure which was more exciting. But I've always wondered, since that's when I came into the world, is that the reason I love Thanksgiving so much? Because that's the time I was born. And my mom was, was young at the time, and, and, uh, and really when I think about it, I, I wonder what, what she thought I would become. What she thought uh, of really, I have other, other siblings, what would we become? What kind of things would we do in the world? Because it wasn't really that much earlier that my mom herself was born in a hospital in Bend, Oregon, to my grandmother, Edna. And what would she become? And all these, all these things that we anticipate. And if you're a parent or grandparent, you know what that feels like, the anticipation, the excitement of this new, new little human coming into the world. And what, what would they do? What kinds of things would happen? Would they become president? You know, would they do, solve major issues in the world? Who would they, who would they marry? If they're gonna have, are they going to have kids? All this anticipation that happens, and we know this happens thousands and thousands and thousands of times every day. Moms, dads, moms, young girls, uh, couples anticipating this, this family that was starting with these children and wondering what kind of people they would turn out to be, wondering what that would be like. Parents all over the world wondering what that child would grow up to be. But no child's arrival, no human's arrival to this planet was more anticipated predicted, talked about, wrote about. No other child in human history had that kind of anticipation like we see of this young boy born to this couple in an obscure part of the Middle East, Bethlehem, Judea. No child was anticipated as much as this little boy we have come to know as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. No child has ever been anticipated. And as we enter into this Christmas it's Advent season, we're, we're well into it now. We're kicking off a series that's going to look at or try to unpack some of the many, many prophecies, uh, statements about Jesus in the scriptures that point directly to him. So we're going to try to do that in this series, and, and I hope you, you could stick with us for each of the Sundays. We're starting it today. We're going to carry this series talking about the some 300 or so prophecies. Well, some scholars say even more than that. But, it, but we're going to unpack some of those that point to this amazing human history-altering character named Jesus Christ. And I hope you could stick with, with us in this season my name is Pastor Ben. I'm glad you're here. If it's your first Sunday, welcome. It's always awesome to have you here. And in person is great. And if you're online with us today, we see you. Thank you for being here. We're gathered like this, like we do every first day of the week. This is Sunday, the first day of the week. We gather. We take a deep breath. Let's do that together. Science says that does replenish us. And it's the first day of the week. Why do we meet on Sundays? Christ followers all over the globe for thousands of years have gathered on Sundays. Why? Because about 2,000 years ago, really what this whole series is about, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth was born in a miraculous way, lived a perfect life, did amazing things, healed people, raised people from the dead. But on, uh, about three years into his earthly ministry, he was killed on a Roman cross. But he didn't stay there because on the third day, on a Sunday morning, he rose from the dead, changing human history and many of our lives forever. That's why we gather on Sundays. We remember Jesus. So let's, uh, let's pause for a word of prayer and then get into our, our, our talk today, which is episode one, Christ is born. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your love and faithfulness, your mercies that are new every morning. Father, we lean in to not only hear the story once again, but to see how you had this all figured out way beforehand. 
and that, Father, you have, uh, your will is, is going to be accomplished, and we trust you because you're good this morning. Help us to lean in, to encourage one another, to sing, to pray, to spur one another on to love and good deeds, and ultimately bring your light to the world around us, even on this Christmas 2021. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Well, scholars would say that the first indication in the Bible, and and the Bible, that's a big term, right? What we really mean is a collection of 66 books, an anthology, really, a library of all of these books, but cover to cover, this is a, a unified story, as the Bible Project would say over and over again, a unified story leading to Jesus. But, but scholars would, would say the first inkling, the first clue that God had a long game in mind shows up in Genesis 3. So if you have a Bible or a device, you can kind of follow along. We're going to kind of do a, a highlight reel, if you will, of some of these prophecies. And again, we can't get to all of them. We don't have the time to do that. you got to get to lunch at some point. But we're going to look at some of these. And the first one shows up in this, 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 this strange sort of way. In Genesis 3, we have, of course, creation. We have the, the song of creation, and we have God creating things and you know, setting everything in motion. But then, in, in Genesis 3, we have what scholars call the fall. And if you're familiar with the story, you get the first humans, Adam and Eve, and God told them, hey, enjoy, but don't enjoy from one tree. And if you remember the story, don't eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Don't eat from that one. Uh, so really, just one restriction. But other than that, ha- ha- have at it. Well, if you, if you know the context, we have you know, the first humans, Adam and Eve, they, they are deceived by this serpent character. And it's a curious story, and there's a lot we can unpack with this, because this, the serpent doesn't sound like the kind of snakes I see. This, this uh, serpent character seems very, uh, almost human-like and very deceptive, and he tries to turn God's words around. You know, very interesting situation going on, but through this interaction, Adam and Eve, our few, first, first humans, they, they decide to eat from that tree that they weren't supposed to, and uh, chaos ensues. Things go sideways for humanity very fast. But in that interaction, in that fall, if you will, God gives a prophecy that's very curious. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, listen to this. I will put enmity, that is strife, enmity between you and the woman. And he's talking to this serpent character. So I'm going to put enmity between you and this this woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, O serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. Now you might be thinking, Ben, ah, that doesn't seem, that is it. there's no Jesus in that phrase. There's no, what's going on here? Why would scholars call this the first inkling, the first clue of one coming? Well, right here we get a little glimpse of this descendant of this first human. Someday will crush, that is put a fatal blow to evil, and represented by this serpent. One day, one of your children, is what this prophecy is basically saying, is going to put a fatal blow to evil. But evil's not just going to just grin and take it. Evil's going to be slashing at your heel the whole way. Now, there's a lot we can unpack here, but, but you get the inkling of not only a coming victor, a coming character that's going to blow away evil for all good, but evil's not just going to be quiet. And so you get this interplay of this, this, this battle that's going to ensue for humanity. This battle that this serpent and all his inklings are going to be trying to do to hurt humankind. Sting them. Bite them in the heel. But one day, one is coming that will deal the fatal, fatal blow to evil. So, yeah, you might think, well, that still seems kind of obscure. Yeah, many times I think we, we read these prophecies, and I'm not totally sure that the ones speaking them, the ones writing them, the ones talking about them even knew necessarily they were talking about a Jesus Christ of Nazareth born in the first century for the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire didn't even exist then, right? But we get these clues that start to stack up. And the New Testament writers will begin to go, oh, they all fit together in a miraculous way. So Genesis 3.15 is our first inkling of this, this, this one coming, this victor over sin and evil and death. 
So then we meet a character. We're going to fast forward in the story now. Abraham, we meet him in chapter 12 of Genesis. And, and Abraham is an interesting character, but God gives him a, a, a special role and gives him this, 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 this idea that one day his descendants, see, he didn't have any kids yet, but one day his descendants would form a great nation. And beyond even that, they would be a blessing to all people, all nations. And so that happens for the first time in Genesis 12. The Lord lets Abraham and his, his descendants uh, understand that they were, they were going to have a great nation that's going to be a blessing to everybody. So more than just one race. So we get these inklings, right? So then when we skip to Genesis 17, which is actually when Abraham and Sarah have their baby. So it took a while. And, we have, and they're in their old age, so they ought not to be having children at this point. They're having children. Isaac comes, miraculous, interesting, right? A miraculous child is born uh, in their old age. And, uh, and we get that promise restated in Genesis 17. Right before you know, they have the birth of Isaac here in their old age, we get more anticipation about the fact that these descendants are going to multiply and you're going to see more than stars in the sky and they're going to be a blessing to the world. So we get these clues stacked on one another. Now, if we fast forward to when this nation was going to happen, the very promise that God gave to Abraham, your descendants will form a nation. Well, right before that happens, we get uh, some more clues. Now, we, if we fast forward to the picture, we, now we have Moses on the scene. Another great big Bible character, right? And we, by the way, last year we went through a whole series called the Torah. Very helpful to understand how those first five books work. But we get to this forming of a nation. So we're about to, all these people were rescued. The Hebrew people were rescued out of Egypt. And they're heading to Canaan, uh, the promised land. Right before that happened, we get another curious clue from an obscure pagan prophet. So think of like Nostradamus or something, some character that's not in the, the, the Christian camp, not in even the Jewish camp. This pagan philosopher, soothsayer, he's called in scripture Balaam the son of Bor. He says this as he says it to the nation, kind of, kind of proclaims it to these people right before they're going to go to the promised land. And in Numbers 24, 17, listen to this curious statement. I see him but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. So that's curious. We have some new details. We have a star that's going to rise from the family line that we've been talking about all this time. Back from the first humans, then to Abraham, and then to Moses, and all God's people who are going to form a nation. From those family lines, specifically the family line of Jacob, we are going to have a star rising. So that, that means, that sounds like light to me. A star is going to bring light to a dark world. Is this starting to sound like Christmas yet? Okay, hang on with me. A star is going to rise, and then a scepter. What does a scepter sound like to you? King, royal. You've got to have a statement, you know, my signature ring. I've got to have a, 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 a symbol of my authority. So a scepter is going to come. So now we get this inkling of a king. Curious. These, mo these, these clues are starting to stack up. Well, right before, again, we're still in the time frame. The people are about ready to go into the promised land, start this new nation, and yay, it's going to go great for a little while. But they're going to start this new nation. Before that happens, Moses, who has been their leader, he can't go into the promised land. There's all kinds of things we can unpack about that. But he gives a final swan song. He says, don't forget, one of these days, don't forget. He gives that final statement to the people. And in Deuteronomy 18, we get a couple of curious statements. Listen to what he says. This is Moses speaking now. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you and from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Again, he says this in, in verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. Now, if you remember, Jesus often would say, 
I only speak what the Father has given me. You see, these clues begin to stack up. Yes, they may not have known completely then, but now we can see all these starting to line up in a beautiful tapestry. So what do we have so far? We have, we're told there's going to be a victor. Remember Genesis 3. There's going to be a victor who's going to crush, deal the fatal blow to, to evil and sin and death, right? So we know that. Uh, he, this, this is going to lead to a blessing to all nations. Jesus came for everyone. Blessing to all nations. So line of Abraham is going to be a blessing to all nations. So we got that. Again, we're building clues, right? So, okay, so we got that. And then we have a star and a scepter. A light bringer and a king. And now we got that latest piece, which was a prophet like Moses who would lead people to freedom. These things started... Now you start to put it together in your head why Jesus often said to the religious leaders of his day, have you not read? Because if you think about it, when we celebrated at Christmas... Not totally accurate to have the wise men at his birth. But anyway, the side note. But the wise men, who weren't even Jewish, figured it out. They were from the Middle East somewhere. And they journeyed. And the people who were running the nation of Israel, the religious leaders totally missed it. And these wise guys knew it was coming. Even knew the date and the time. And so Jesus, when he says, have you never read? He's talking to those religious leaders that were supposed to have things figured out. And they missed it. Oh, the things that we might miss if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention, right? So, now, well, let's add to this. So the psalmist. Uh, see, before this paragraph here in my notes, all we've been doing is the first five books of the Bible. That's it. We ended in Deuteronomy. That's what we call the Torah. Just the first five books. We haven't even gotten through the writings and the prophets. You see, when, when in the first century, when, 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 when Jewish people were talking about their scriptures, they often called it what we would say now the Tanakh, which is Torah, the writings, and the prophets. So we haven't even gotten to the writings and the prophets yet, so let's do that now. The psalmist, now there's 150 psalms. We're not going to cover all of them, but you'll get some more clues. In the psalms, we learn things like this. We learn... That this victor, this coming one, will be God's son. God's going to have a son? We will learn that he's eternal. That, that he's majestic. That sounds very kingly. He would be the one true Lord of all. In fact, what is it? Psalm 24 or 25, he's going to be the king of the angel armies. He's going to have a heavenly kingship that's going to rule for all time. And... The psalmist tells us that he's going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest before we even had the nation of Israel, before really Abraham was around. God had, if I haven't said it enough already, a long game in mind. He had a long game in mind. And boy, we would be smart to trust it. So we had this long game. When we get to the, the prophets, we can't leave out the prophets. I mean, that's what this whole series is called, foretold by the prophets. We can't for, forget them. The big prophet that we have in the Old Testament, one of the biggest, is Isaiah. And in Isaiah, you know some of his prophecies. I'm, I guarantee if you've ever, if you've been alive at Christmas time, in around any kind of religious circles, you've heard Isaiah 9. A unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given. You've, you've heard that. We sing about it. But Isaiah adds that this would be a male child, interesting, but he would be a light emanating from Galilee beyond the Jordan. So hold on a minute. Now these clues are starting to stack up so much and they're starting to get specific. So now we've learned that he's going to be emitting light from Galilee. And one of the critics of Jesus in the first century, and they're, they're having a debate about Jesus and who he could possibly be, and the religious leaders say, check the scriptures, never says he comes from Galilee. He did. They missed it. They missed it. It was in Isaiah. He would be a light emanating from Galilee. Whoever comes from Galilee, that small little podunk town, Jesus did. 
Isn't that more? Let's read the passage that we all need to read at Christmas time, right? Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. If you have it in your Bible, you've got to read this one. For unto us, you know this probably, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government what shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We got some new titles, some new clues. Of the increase of his government, and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom. So now we're, we're learning all kinds of things. Line of David, child of Jacob, part of Abraham's family. We're learning all of these clues and that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. His kingdom will have righteousness and justice from this time forth and ever forevermore. We have an eternal kingdom. All of these clues. Now, if you add the prophet Jeremiah, both Jeremiah and Isaiah confirm he's a line of David. So be looking for someone who was born with the line of David. Now, Scripture would, would tell us, in fact, the gospel writers, both Mary and Joseph, have ties back to David. Isn't that interesting? It goes way back, but... Isn't that interesting? So, again, more and more clues. Isaiah 11, 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days... Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. Listen to this. The Lord is our righteousness. Whose righteousness is what we concerned about? Our righteousness won't cut it. Right here, we even get a glimpse of how he's going to start saving us. We get this little clue of who's actually going to do the obedience part. We struggle. And right here, we get this clue that he's going to be our righteousness. He's going to do it for us. You see all these layers begin to add up, and this, this, the, the clues begin to, to start to point to this obscure birth in the first century. And I, I love this. We have a curious interaction in, in Isaiah. If we, we could stay there for a few more moments. In Isaiah chapter 7, and you, you're familiar with this phrase too, or this statement, but in, in, in Isaiah 7, we get this interaction between the prophet Isaiah and the king Ahaz. King Ahaz was not a stand-up king, evil king. We have this interaction. Let me just read it to you in, in Isaiah 7, verse 13 and 14. Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And guess what that is fulfilled in? We say, we sing the song, Emmanuel, God with us. The New Testament confirms, Matthew chapter 1 confirms. Now, we could, we could point to other prophecies. We've got a few more weeks. We're going to cover some of those, but I, I can't leave out a few more, if you'll indulge me. Daniel, you might be familiar with Daniel and the Old Testament. It's a very interesting book to read. Daniel covers a span of a lot of years. There's a lot of things going on. Daniel's one of the exiles of Israel. Remember, the nation was started. We read about that a little bit, and Moses talking to the nation. It goes great for a very short time, and then they go into civil war, and then they get taken over by other nations. I'm, a, I'm going very fast. But when we get to Daniel, he's in exile. He's one of the Israelites who is taken, because he probably was young and smart, taken to exile in Babylon. So the, the conquering kingdom pulled him away. And he writes some incredible things. And, and he's a great leader. He's a prayer warrior. Uh, he's bold for God. He even is a bit of a prophet. And he speaks of one day, Israel and, and exiles, my fellow exiles, one day there will be this son of man who will do amazing things. This son of man, this ancient of days is coming. Isn't it interesting? In the past, he's predicting a future son of man that will be the ancient of days, meaning before days even began. 
You see, this is just mind-boggling how all this is coming together. So Daniel confirms he's going to be the Son of Man. In fact, that's the term that Jesus used most often when he speaks about himself, which emphasizes his humanity, certainly, but also he's referred to as the Son of God. So that's his mission. So when he says Son of Man, Son of God, he's emphasizing both his humanity and his divine mission. He uses that often. So we can't leave out Daniel. But then we get to Hosea. And Hosea speaks here that he would be taken, listen, to, I'll, I'll read the phrase. This is in Hosea's uh, book. He, that is the Lord, this coming one, would be the Lord's beloved son who he calls out of Egypt. Mary and Joseph and little boy were never supposed to be in Egypt. You know why they went to Egypt? They were on the run. They had to flee this this puppet king called Herod, who was trying to, like, murder people. So they took off to, to, to Egypt, and you think, well, that's just a random thing. They're just, they're just doing, you know, what they got to do to survive. And Hosea said, actually, we're going to call, and, and at one point, God's going to call Joseph in a dream, hey, come back, out of Egypt. These clues began to line up. Okay, one more. Can I do one more? Micah. You probably haven't read a lot in Micah. He's another prophet, a minor prophet we'd call not because they're insignificant, but Micah, uh, Micah, he narrows down this coming one, this, this coming victor, you know, the star and the scepter and the blessing to all nations, this, this, this son of man. And, and Micah says that he would be a family descendant of Judah. Now we're getting family line specific, not just the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but now a descendant of Judah, one of the twelve. And he would come forth as a ruler in Israel, an ancient of days, from, drum roll, where do you think they're going to say this ancient of days is going to be coming from? Bethlehem. Ephratha. All of these clues stacked up. Now you may be thinking, okay, great, Ben, for the last 15, 20 minutes you've been blabbing on about these predictions, these old documents said this person is coming. What, what does it matter? Why, why does all this matter? Okay, so some old documents said that this Jesus would be born. Great, I've got an activity scene at home. We're good. What does all this mean? Why does this matter? What's the big deal? Well, I'll just share from my heart why I think it's a big deal for me. Because God has always had a long game. I mean, you look at the sordid tale of Scripture, the 66 books, humanity's up and down. Trusting God, then turning their backs on him. And trusting God, turning their backs. There's this whole sordid tale. There's a lot of goofy, crazy things happen. God had a plan before any of this actually happened. Long before any arrival took place, God had a plan. And these prophets, these documents, were set in motion hundreds and hundreds of years before the first century. So for me, it grants me a little bit of confidence that God has always had a plan. He's always had his agenda. Even with the ups and downs and the goofballness of humanity, he always had a plan. God had a long game, and, and this was all predicted before Jesus ever came on the scene, which is why Jesus would often say to those religious leaders that wanted to kill him, have you not read? 300 or so clues. You can add lots more to that probably. Hundreds of clues pointing to even where he would be born, what town he would be born. All of these clues were happening. And I realize it's hard in the moment to understand what God is sometimes saying to us. Maybe we miss some clues here and there. I've missed a few clues that I think God has given me. I don't want to miss too many. I don't want to miss more. These clues pointed to Jesus. And that's why it matters because of this one reason, that before creation began, God had a plan, so you, you and I can trust it, so we can trust it. We got to trust the story. We got to trust that his love is great and beyond our screw-ups. We have to trust the story. Before creation ever began, God had a plan. And you know what? He had you in mind. This is what blows my mind. He had me in mind. He had you in mind. We used to say in the early days of our church family, that discovering God's dream is all about this, that a long time ago, before you and I were ever born, 
God had you and I in mind. And he didn't just have us in mind like some kind of a picture book. He had you and I in mind because he loves us already. And he would do anything to be in a great relationship with us. He wanted a personal relationship with you. He, he wanted to be in relationship with us. Before you ever took your first breath, God had you in mind. He had a long game. He had you in mind, and he had a smile on his face the moment you took your first breath because he'd been waiting for you. Before we were ever born, God had you and I in mind, and he wanted to be in a relationship with us. And even when sin threatened that dream, God would have none of it. He even put on flesh, walked among us, paid for every sin, past, present, and future, rose from the dead and said, now there's a new way to be human. God himself put on flesh. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. Before you and I were ever born, he loved you already. You might be thinking, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust this story. Things are difficult in my life. I'm screwed up too many times. He loves you already. He loved you before you made that mistake. And he loved you while you were making that mistake. And he loved you after you screwed up. That's the kind of love we're talking about. Before we were ever born, before creation began, God had a plan so we can trust it. I realize we're in a weird time in the world. It's dark at night. Things are going crazy. There's all kinds of things pulling us away from faith. And maybe some of us in this room are, 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 are worried. Maybe we're thinking maybe God doesn't have this on his hands. We sing a song when we were kids back in church. He's got the whole world in his hands. But maybe you're at a point right now where you're like, I don't know if I can trust him. I don't know. I don't know if I can do it. The world's too crazy. I don't know, God, really, are you really up there? Do you really have a plan? We might be tempted to not trust his story. We might be tempted not to trust his plan. But when we do, it's always hurtful to us. And it may be dark right now for you, but I, I, I'm just saying this from, from my own experience and from so many over the years of time and faith, that when we trust God, trust him at his word, he comes through may not be exactly the time or place we think it will, but God will do He's got a long game for you. He, he's loved you before you ever took your first breath. This is so crucial. And that's why this matters. Because God's had a plan. He's not surprised by any of this COVID stuff. He's had a plan way before this began. And he loves you. And he wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust his plan. Trust the story. We say about this often, and the Bible Project says it too, right? Cover to cover, the Bible is a, is a coherent, unified story leading to Jesus. Because Jesus is the proof of, of God's love, past, present, and future for you. He loved you before you were ever born. And that's good news. So in our mess, in our difficulty, God has a long game for you. You don't have to be stuck there. If you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have to be stuck in addiction. You don't have to be stuck in those cycles anymore. He has declared victory over you. Now, we may sometimes not trust it and go another way, but he's already declared that victory for you in your life. He came to bring freedom. Remember, one like Moses would come one day. But he didn't just bring freedom for a nation. He brought freedom from sin and death. He loved you before the world began. Before the world began, he had you in mind. We could trust him. That's why when we get to Christmas, we can sing of the great goodness of God. And we can sing this song that I want you to help me with as we end. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Indeed he is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. So much you loved us that you would do anything to be in a relationship with us. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for what he did. Thank you that he was born. Thank you that he was predicted and talked about for so long so that we would know it. Father, help us not to miss anything you have for us. And Father, as we go out this week, as we go out this season, Father, I pray that we would take your light and your love to everyone around us, that they would get to know that hope too, that they would get to know you had a plan and you loved them before even the world began. Father, help us to bring that light to the people around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've come to a time of response in our service. And as I was thinking this week about what to say as we're moving into communion, I thought of a conversation that I had with a friend of mine about how as we've grown older and experienced more life that it's, t it's difficult and challenging, but not in the ways that we thought it was going to be challenging. 
And I think we hear that often, we've heard that a lot this year, that cliche of nothing could have prepared us for this. And that's true. In many ways, we don't know exactly what's coming. But as we look at scripture, we see so many examples of people going through hardship and experiencing difficult things. And so as Christians, if we think about it, we really should be more prepared than anyone else for challenges and hardships. We see in Matthew chapter 26, it's in verse 39, Jesus is praying on the night that he's gonna be betrayed. And he's praying fervently and he says, my father, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, if it's possible this cup can pass from me, let it be so. But not my will, let your will be done. And I think that's such a challenging idea to dwell on. The idea that Jesus' sacrifice was so great and so painful that he wanted to know if there was any other way. And we meant that much to him. Not, not his will, but the Father's will. And it's a complex and challenging thing to think about, but I think it can also be encouraging, and it's something that's really important to focus on as we move into communion and we take the bread and the cup to remember that Jesus was willing to make that sacrifice for us. And if you feel led in this time of response as you're as you're talking to God and praying to give financially to the ministries here at Dallas Church, you can do that online or here in the building through our giving boxes. As we take communion and move into this Christmas season, let's give that transformative love to those around us and show them why it's so transformative because not only does God's love prepare us for hardship, it also fills us with hope. So let's take communion together.
one who came for us. Glory in the highest. Praise the name of Jesus, our King has come. Well, thank you for joining us today. Again, if you're new, stop by the connection table and see me for your gift. Uh, coming up, our Christmas services this year will be on December 23rd, which is Christmas Eve Eve. Uh, we'll be opening the doors at 6.30 and having uh, the service at 7. Uh, so invite friends and family and just come and enjoy a good time together. Uh, let's go trust the story, trust the plan, and ultimately trust God and go be the church. <laughs>